Maybe I should I pull up the PowerPoint? Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're just going to take a minute or two uh, to let everybody join us this evening. In the meantime, I'd love to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Charlotte Spang, and I'm the Field Outreach Coordinator at the Seattle Aquarium. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm joined by Danny Kendall, the field program specialist who's behind the scenes managing our IT needs this evening, as she manages so many things throughout our season. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We hope you will enjoy learning about what makes our local Cedar River watershed such a special place for us and for the salmon, and that you will continue to join us for parts two and three of this series. Next Tuesday, we will hear from fisheries biologist Aaron Bosworth about salmon species in the Cedar, their status and population trends. And then on October 20th, we'll hear from Jason Mulvihill Kuntz about efforts to restore salmon and what we can all do to help. Before we get started this evening, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people who have cared for these lands and salmon for 10,000 years. Fall on the Cedar River is a magical time and I encourage each one of you to get out to the river or to your local river or stream to watch these amazing fish as they return to the river they were born in to reproduce the next generation of fish. Over 137 species and the health of our river forest ecosystem depends on this annual cycle. It's critical to all of us. While we aren't able to be out on the cedar this fall with our volunteer naturalists due to COVID-19, we're excited to be able to bring this three-part series to you. As background, the Cedar River Salmon Journey Program is celebrating its 23rd year this fall. And uh, it is really a highlight for me personally to be out there. Um, so again, I do encourage each and every one of you to get out to your local river or stream if you can. This program would not be possible without the contributions of many people, volunteers, staff, colleagues, and partners at other organizations and our funders. In particular, we at the Seattle Aquarium would like to thank our funding partners, Seattle Public Utilities and King County. This year's program is funded by the Cooperative Watershed Management Grant Program through the King County Flood Control District and the Lake Washington Cedar Sammamish Watershed Salmon Recovery Council. We also receive funding from the MMS Foundation. We are grateful for the amazing support we receive from so many and thank you to all of you. For tonight's presentation, we will be hearing from Katie Klon, Education Specialist with Seattle Public Utilities Cedar River Watershed Education Center. After getting a teaching and art degree at Western Washington University, Katie began a career in environmental education with the interest of connecting people to nature. 
She has worked at the Watershed Education Center since 2002 and earned her master's in science education. She loves working with all ages and watching people fall into awe with our natural world. Katie will be taking questions at the end of her presentation. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask a question anytime. And I'm gonna read the questions at the end of Katie's uh, uh, lecture this evening. Also, if you have any technical trouble, please let us know via Q&A or email salmonjourney at seattleaquarium.org and we will try to help you as we can. Without further ado, welcome Katie. I'm gonna undo my uh, video and mute myself and unshare my screen and then you can start uh, sharing your screen. Thank you, Charlotte. Alrighty, I hope we're up and running. Good evening. Thank you for that introduction, Charlotte. Um, and yes, I am Katie Klon with Seattle Public Utilities. And normally at this time of year, we're doing trainings um, on the river and with real people. So um, this is a pale substitute, but I'm really excited that we have a chance to reach so many of you uh, through this online format. And tonight we are going to be talking about the history of the Cedar River watershed, um, how the river has sustained people and salmon for thousands of years. And we're also going to be looking at some of the issues that the river and its salmon um, are facing today. So this is all about the salmon. Um, and I just wanted to start with a little excerpt. Feel free to enjoy gazing upon this lovely Chinook as I read this next excerpt to you from Salmon Without Rivers. Salmon are among the oldest natives of the Pacific Northwest, and over millions of years, they learned to inhabit and use nearly all of the region's freshwater, estuarine, and marine habitats. From a mountaintop where an eagle carries a salmon carcass to feed its young, out to the distant oceanic waters, the salmon have penetrated the Northwest to an extent unmatched by any other animal. They are like silver threads woven deep into the fabric of the Northwest ecosystem. So what I wanted to do um, in, today, in tonight's lecture is to look at the fabric of our Northwestern ecosystem and see how the salmon have woven their way through it over time and space. Um, so here is the fabric that we are working with in the Cedar River watershed. Um, it extends from the crest of the Cascades at the eastern boundary all the way down um, as it enters into Lake Washington at the site of Renton. And then you can see Lake Sammamish and Lake Washington parallel lakes there. Um, Lake Sammamish flows into Lake Washington and together all of that water is heading out to the Puget Sound through the Chittenden Locks in Ballard. And keep in mind that the Puget Sound area did not look like this all of the time. Um, in fact, they were sculpted by the actions of glaciers. So um, we're gonna go back in time, quite a bit of time. Um, and about 19,000 years ago, um, glaciers started to descend uh, from the Canadian border, what now is the Canadian Washington border, and they descended um, and came down across the landscape, terminating just south of Olympia. And about um, at, at that point, it was um, about, took about 2,000 years for that process to uh, happen. And it was at that point, about 17,000 years ago, that the ice was at its thickest. And if you can imagine this, uh, there were, it, Seattle would have been covered with 3,000 feet of ice. So to put that into perspective, that would be about five space needles high of ice covering where you are probably sitting right now at this very moment. So as those glaciers receded uh, over 
again, thousands of years, they deposited tons of gravel that then became perfect habitat for spawning and rearing salmon. And by 11,000 years ago, the glaciers had retreated to the north and they were carving out Puget Sound in its wake. Um, this exposed brand new habitats of freshwater lakes, um, as well as Puget Sound. And you can see on this map from about 11,000 11, years ago, uh, made by the Burke, you can see Lake Washington, what has now become Lake Washington, and Lake Sammamish. And it was right around this time that people began inhabiting this area as well. The Bear Creek site, in, which is right next to where Redmond Town Center is, um, it was found to be 12,000 years old um, that people had been living there. And to put that into some perspective, that's 600 generations of people who have been living in this area. And if we look to the east, uh, up in the Cedar River watershed at Lake Nook New, present day Chester Morse Lake, there were settlements that were found to be over 9,400 years old. Um, now, if you were to talk to the descendants of the people who lived on these lands, they would say, well, we've lived here since time immemorial um, because this is where the Creator made us. And that would be since forever, since the beginning of time, since beyond being able to count the number of years. Um, so settlements, uh, are, we're going to just zoom in a little bit. I tried to take the labels off this map as well as I could just to be able to see what the Lake Washington Basin looked like um, pre-European arrival. So see if you can look at this map and identify where possibly you live on this map um, and see if you can notice anything that's different in this map than how you know the landscape to be today. <clears throat> so as the landscape became more stable, um, this was about 5,000 years ago, family-based villages developed throughout the area. And uh, these would be the ancestors of today's Muckleshoot, Duwamish, Snoqualmie, and Suquamish tribes. And just as salmon are continuing to come up the rivers today, uh, they colonized this area as soon as the glaciers retreated and salmon would have been um, and continued to be an important part of all of those tribes traditions. So thanks to the Burke Museum's Water Lines Project, they published this map that, sh that helps us to know what some of those original names were for the sites all around Lake Washington. These are sites where people lived in um, sometimes many longhouses, sometimes smaller family settings. And I can't even begin to pronounce uh, most of these names, except for one, uh, if you can find Shilshul, that's where the Ballard Locks are today. If you can imagine a canoe coming in from Puget Sound and uh, needing to find that narrow inlet in which to land, that uh, shilshul translates into threading a needle. Um, another, no, another lake that caught my eye that I enjoyed the name of um, is just northeast of there. It's today's Holler Lake. Uh, which was known as a place to go calm down. I might go there after this. Um, and just south of there, continuing down, a place to turn around or cross over. That's present day Pioneer Square, where at that time it was a tidal inlet. So depending on what the tide was doing, it might be a good place to turn around, or if the tide was out, maybe you could even cross over it. Um, and I do wanna draw your attention north of there to where today's Montlake Cut would be. Now, perhaps you'll notice this already, but there is no waterway connecting Lake Washington to Lake Union. And so this is the name to lift a canoe. This is where you would need to be getting your canoe out of the water um, and to transport it, portage it over to where you could then continue to um, continue the transport. Um, and then working your way south, this is all important for how our story unfolds, you can see two places called a confluence. 
And one of those confluences is where the Cedar River joins into the Black River. Let me get my pointer out. Um, should have been using this all along. Sorry about that. Uh, so here's where the Cedar River is joining up with the Black River. And here is another confluence where the Black River is joining up with what becomes the Duwamish River. So at this time, before Europeans showed up on the landscape, Lake Washington was not called Lake Washington. It flowed, its outflow was at the southern end into the Black River where the Cedar River then joined it and together they then flowed out into the Puget Sound through the Duwamish River. So um, if we then, let's just work our way east a little bit, we're going to extend our view so that we can see the larger Cedar River watershed extending all the way up to the Cascades. Um, this is present day Chester Morse Lake, uh, primary drinking water reservoir for the greater Seattle area. And it was known as Nook Nu, which translates to place of gathering waters. And from my understanding, it's not just the name of the lake, but they use this name also for the, all of the landscape. It was almost a name for the entire watershed um, that gathered waters and delivered it downstream into the Cedar River. So by the late 1800s, the name had been changed to Cedar Lake. It was named by Catherine Maynard, a wife of Doc Maynard, early settlers, um, European settlers in the Seattle area. Um, and it was more than just names that changed. Um, there were lots of changes going on from the mid 1800s through the early 1900s. There was system systematic displacement of native peoples, throngs of new immigrants coming to town, um, people changed the directional flow of rivers and lakes, in essence, replumbed the entire Lake Washington Basin, even the species of salmon change that were coming up the Cedar River. So um, what we're going to do is take a closer look at some of those big changes between 1850 and the early 1900s and see what impact they had on the fabric of today. The Great Seattle Fire, 1889. This prompted the city to develop the Cedar River watershed for a water supply. So by 1901, folks in the city of Seattle had recovered from the fire, they'd rebuilt, and they had clean, gravity-fed water coming out of their faucets. Um, and the result of that fire ultimately was that we today have 90,000 acres of land that has been preserved to protect the quality of drinking water and it also serves as an ecological preserve. So just a few, um, this is just a thumbnail look at the municipal watershed. We're calling it the municipal uh, watershed because this is the part that is owned by the city of Seattle in order to protect drinking water. Landsberg is where the drinking water intake is. So that's marked on the map at the western edge. Um, and all of the land east of there that's within the watershed is protected. People are kept out. Nobody lives there. There is no recreation. Here's our population. Zero. <laughs> and they uh, determined early on that the best way to protect drinking water was to simply keep people out of the lands because whatever goes on the land goes in the water. Um, as I said, it's a little over 90,000 acres, which is about one and a half cities of Seattle could fit on that amount of land. It's almost 100% owned by the city of Seattle. Um, and it's had an extensive history of logging. 85% of the forest has been logged in the past, but we do have 15% still in old growth. Chester Morse Lake is the primary lake um, that is protected within those boundaries. There are two dams, Masonry and Landsberg Dam. And it has 14 river miles of the Cedar, as well as 24 different tributaries, all feeding into the Cedar River. And 83 species, including some threatened uh, species, make their home in the Cedar River Municipal Watershed. 
So we're just going to take a little journey so that you can, it's like your tour from your armchair so that you can see some of the landscapes within the municipal watershed. This is at the easternmost boundary at Twilight Lake where about half of this water drains into the Yakima River watershed on the eastern side of the mountains and about half comes down into the cedar um, and eventually flows into Chester Morse Lake. And you've heard me call this lake a few different things by now. Um, its first known name was Nooknu, Place of Gathering Waters. It was renamed Cedar Lake in the late, late 1800s. And in 1957, it was named for William Chester Morse, who was a uh, early water superintendent for the city of Seattle. And it was uh, renamed that by his son. So you can follow along on the map. The red dots show where we are. That is the location of Chester Morse Lake. Um, and from there, if you were to continue west, you'd run into the Masonry Dam. And the dam was completed in 1914, still holding up quite well, in fact. And it was built initially to help retain water for power generation. Um, which it's still used today, although when it was first built, it provided 100% of Seattle's electricity, whereas today it just provides 1.5% of Seattle's electricity needs. Um, but it generates about 30 megawatts. And then the water continues down the river about 14 miles until it arrives at the westernmost boundary, Landsberg Diversion Dam. So this is not a retention dam, it's simply there to divert water um, over to become possibly drinking water. About 18% of the river each year is diverted for human use and that water is treated um, or cleaned or gotten ready for people in a variety of ways. It's sent through screens to take out the big chunks, after which point it's treated with chlorine and fluoride at Landsberg. Uh, fluoride to keep teeth strong and fluor uh, sorry, chlorine uh, is used to disinfect the pipes and fluoride is, was added in the 1960s per a citizen vote, um, finding that it helped prevent tooth decay. And at Lake Young's is where it gets um, additional treatment. These are the primary disinfectants, ozone and UV light. Mineral lime is added to um, prevent if somebody has an older home with lead pipes, it prevents the lead from getting leached from the pipes and into the water. So that raises the pH to make that safe. Um, and one more dose of chlorine is added, one part per million. That's a tiny amount um, to disinfect the pipes before it comes to many in-city reservoirs where it's clean and ready to drink. These are some of the cities that get either all of their water or part of their water from the Cedar River. Maybe even you. In total, it's about 850,000 people who are getting their water from the Cedar River. So now we have on the other side of Landsberg, just over the fence, you might say, or outside of the pipe, we've got the lower Cedar River watershed. So now that the drinking water has been put into pipes, um, we still care about it, but we don't need to protect it in such a hardy way. So uh, this area of land, of course, is open to development and plenty of human activity. So a few facts about the lower watershed. Its population comes in at about 100,000. And its size is 42,000 acres. So just about half the size of the municipal watershed. <clears throat> it has a variety of habitats within it, human habitats that are very urban, all the way to rural um, old farms that are along uh, the river there, as well as forested habitats. Um, a lot of the cities like Renton and Maple Valley, parts of Maple Valley, they get their water from groundwater. So even though the Cedar River is flowing right through their backyard, uh, folks in Renton are getting their water from an aquifer, very clean water uh, right under their city. 
It includes 21 river miles and 15 named tributaries. So if we take a look, we can see that parts of the Cedar River on the other side and outside of the protected boundary um, certainly look quite natural. Um, and then when we get down to the mouth of the Cedar, closer to where it is routed into Lake Washington, we can see that it's been highly channelized um, and uh, manipulated by human forces. <clears throat> So let's take another look at our map from pre, um, this was pre-European settlement, except I still have, um, I still have some of the labels are up there. So that just kind of gives you some context so that you know where you're at. Um, and here's my pointer. Here comes the Cedar River. And remember how the river, originally went down uh, and exited through the Black River. The Cedar River joined up with the Black River there. And here you can see Renton sandwiched between these two rivers. So as you might imagine, they had issues with flooding uh, from an early time, um, which is kind of a problem when you are that close to those river systems. So even as early as 1899, they were working on figuring out some way to, oh, my lights just went out, um, figuring out some way to keep that river where they wanted it to be so that they could protect their own um, property. Um, by 1911, they'd had enough and they had, they decided to, <laughs> thanks Danny. <laughs> I, was I was too still for too long and the lights turned out. Um, so they created a channel to route the Cedar River uh, right into Lake Washington. <clears throat> so that was the very first step to the big replumbing of the Lake Washington Basin. Um, and as you can see, if we compare these two maps, this is the earlier map. Here is the later one. Um, routing the Cedar River into Lake Washington, that happened in 1912. Uh, and then they embarked upon creating a passageway from Lake Washington all the way out to Puget Sound, creating the locks, the ship canal, the Mont Lake Cut. Um, <clears throat> and this was all to enhance trade and commerce in this growing port of Seattle. And so by 1917, this whole thing had been engineered. So this now became the exit for Lake Washington the Cedar River became the entrance, and what's missing here? <laughs> you can see that the Black River is no more. So when the locks were put into place, it lowered the level of Lake Washington about nine feet, in essence, just drying up that connector river of the Black River. Um, they completely re-engineered it. And so what were the impacts of this remodeling project? Well, it was devastating to the people who live there, um, specifically the Duwamish tribe that had a village um, that was occupied there right on the banks of the Black River for 1400 years, maybe even thousands of years prior to that. Um, and without the Black River, the salmon didn't come through. So this village site was pretty much, um, was so far removed from all of the resources that uh, brought them there in the first place. One Duwamish tribal member, Joseph Moses, shared his recollections of that time in an oral history. And he said, that was quite a day for the white people at least. The waters just went down, down until our landing and canoes stood dry and there was no Black River at all. There were pools, of course, and the struggling fish trapped in them. People came from miles around, laughing and hollering and stuffing fish into gunny sacks. Those were the last fish to be in the Black River. It, is, um, it was gone from that moment forward. <clears throat> Um, there were devastating impacts for the Chinook salmon because they are engineered, they're built to follow um, 
a significant flow of water. And they're not designed to come in through a river system and hit a, a slow lake. Um, so the numbers of Chinook salmon plummeted as a result. However, um, sockeye salmon, they actually are well suited to this changed habitat and they need a lake between their rearing grounds in the Cedar River and going out to the ocean. They need a year in that lake to get big enough to head out to the ocean. So by creating the system that had Lake Washington right in the middle, it actually worked out quite well for sockeye that were brought in, transplanted from Baker Lake. Um, and uh, they flourished for many decades, um, starting in the 1930s. Uh, and even today, we still have sockeye um, enjoying the habitat of the Cedar River. And some Chinook have also figured out a way to use their amazing sense of smell to continue to come back to the Cedar River, um, even though there is a lake in the way. Um, there were impacts to Lake Washington too. So replumbing it meant that the recharge rate uh, went from every five years to about every two and a half years. So it's a cleaner uh, lake nowadays since the replumbing. Um, cleaner as in not freer of pollutants, but cleaner as in um, it just has a cleaner flow and it's recharging. Um, on a more frequent basis. <clears throat> um, one thing that they did right with these locks, um, I mean, it really did increase possibilities for commerce and moving logs from all the logging operations from freshwater to saltwater um, quite easily. Um, they also, by law, were required to include a fish ladder in its construction. So, here we can see those three main species of salmon that call the Cedar River home today, that live on the fabric of these lands. We have the Chinook, also known as the king, coho or silver, and of course those brilliant sockeye that come back to the river where they were born. So here's just a little refresher on salmon uh, lifestyle. Uh, this is just a generalization. Each species and each fish practically has its own little nuanced uh, timing. But in general, uh, they started as an egg uh, three to five years ago. Then they hatch out of the gravel from their egg as alevin, mature into fry and par and smolt. As they get larger, they're getting closer to the salt water of Puget Sound. And there they head out to the Pacific Ocean where they can hopefully find plenty of food to get nice and big. Hopefully um, an orca gets to eat a few of those Chinook. Um, and we of course hope that uh, at least one or two of those fish are able to return back to the Cedar River in three to five years, coming back to the river where they were born. Um, <clears throat> for those salmon that make their way all up the Cedar River, they make it all the way up those 22 miles and show up at Landsberg Diversion Dam. This is the westernmost boundary of the Cedar River Municipal Watershed. Um, for those salmon, we have a little system in place that makes sure that the salmon go where they need to get to. So um, we have Chinook and Sockeye especially showing up at the same time. And while we can allow all species of fish to go past the dam. Um, sockeye are the one kind of salmon that we don't let go by because they can come back in such great numbers that they could impact water quality. So at our fish passage facility, the sockeye are trapped and taken over to the hatchery. Um, well, they're, uh, the milt and the eggs are mixed and those are taken over to the, ink, the um, the fertilized eggs are taken over to the hatchery where they incubate for a few months until they're released back into the Cedar River that next spring. Um, but the Chinook, I love how Michelle's hands are blocking that Chinook, like do not go into the sockeye pens. No, we have other plans for you. We want those Chinook that are listed as threatened on the endangered species list to be able to go past the dam and into the closed boundaries. 
So they're carefully packaged and quickly walked over upstream of the dam where they can be released gently into the Cedar River where they have access to 27 more miles of not only river but also tributaries coming in um, that are excellent habitat for um, spawning as well as for their offspring to rear in those clean gravels of the Cedar River watershed. So you can see that ever since this fish passage facility is put in, um, it is salmon have been ready to colonize that the area of land above Landsberg. And um, in 2012, we had almost, I think about 275 salmon, um, Chinook salmon coming back <clears throat> to lay their eggs. And of course, when those eggs hatch, they're imprinting on the smell and in three to five years when they return, they're going to be uh, navigating back to that same spot of the river where they were born on the upstream side of Landsberg Dam. So upstream of the dam, it's a pretty good place to be uh, if you're spawning salmon. You've got some very clean water. You've got this incredible riparian area uh, providing shade nice cold water and it's here that the salmon complete their life cycle leaving nourishment for their offspring through their dead carcasses they die one to two weeks after they spawn and there we have some fry emerging from the gravel and heading back down the cedar river through lake washington now i mentioned a riparian area and i I want to call attention to um, that that's a that's a big deal for salmon. This is a really key part of their habitat that's necessary for their well-being. It's that vegetation on the side of a freshwater stream or river <clears throat> that is going to provide uh, falling insects that they can eat. It provides root structure in the river itself to slow the water down. It provides woody debris that's falling into the river and creating different speeds of, um, of water flow that are coming down the river. So if you compare a healthy riparian area to the picture down in Renton where the river has been completely channelized, you can see that it's um, absolutely lacking. There are none of those healthy components that are so critical for salmon habitat. Um, yet our salmon are still coming back. Um, channelization of the river, um, it happens because this is where people live. This is where people have their businesses. And this is where um, people want to protect themselves and their businesses and their, their livelihoods and their property from the damage that a wild river can do. So they have channelized it, but it has come with consequences. Um, downstream in the lower watershed, 14 of those 21 river miles have been armored in some way. So that means that um, it could be riprap, like big boulders on the side of the riverbanks. It could be levees. It could be a concrete channel. Um, but what that means is that there aren't any sandbars or uh, there is, aren't gravel deposits coming in. There aren't overhanging trees that will drop insects um, or nutrients into the river. So when you channelize a river, you are channel, channelizing all of the energy of that river into one place and uh, it, it comes with consequences. So over time that can um, create some problems, especially as we get he heavier rain flows. Um, what can happen is that river needs somewhere to go. <clears throat> and rivers will take the room that they need. Um, the, the lower Cedar River is known for its flood events. And this, as well as habitat loss, um, is another big concern for salmon survival because if a flood of this size comes through, it's going to do what we call scouring. It will scour out the eggs out of the nest or red 
And what that does is it dislodges the eggs and makes them unviable. So a flood can wipe out um, a good chunk of a certain year's population of salmon. And although we do have the masonry dam um, upstream and we can regulate flows with the dam, at some points, uh, if there's a big storm event coming through, we have to open up our floodgates and the water is released and it does cause flooding downstream. We are prioritizing um, protecting salmon habitat. We're prioritizing making sure that um, people don't lose property. However, we are also mandated to release water at a certain point so that the dam itself doesn't fail. So it's a tricky balance um, and we're trying to do whatever we can to alleviate the amount of flooding that happens downstream from our reservoir. So this is what can happen downstream when we do open up those floodgates because it's raining really hard. There's a segment of the quotation that of the excerpt that I read at the beginning that I didn't, I didn't read at all. Um, this was the last sentence or two that I saved for the end. Um, but I'll read it now. The decline of salmon to the brink of extinction is a clear sign of serious problems. The beautiful tapestry that the Northwesterners call home is unraveling. Its silver threads are frayed and broken. So I don't want to leave us on a note of despair, but we do know our salmon populations are declining and that's having an impact on our orca populations they're a keystone species to many. Um, so what I'd like to do is think about what is working in the Cedar River watershed for these salmon. Um, we've got protected headwaters. We've got 90,000 acres that are pr protected in perpetuity um, that provide the Cedar River with some of the cleanest water around. Um, Seattle Public Utilities and King County are actively buying up properties in the floodplain so that we can protect human, uh, humans from loss and we can also uh, reconnect the rivers to their flood, uh, to their flood banks. Um, Rainbow Bend is an example of one that has gone through a restoration process and River Bend is in process right now. They are excellent examples of how communities can come together and it's a win-win for salmon. It's a win-win for uh, the river to have room to spread out and for people to not have the headache of their properties flooding year after year after year. Um, and we're lucky to live in an environmentally conscious community of like-minded folks who care about the environment, who care about the salmon, and we're stronger together because of that. And this is really what's cool, is that the salmon are still here right now. And I am hoping that all of you, if you haven't had a chance already, that you will make a moment in your life to go visit some of our sites to see those salmon. Um, I'm gonna highlight a few of those here. Uh, these are where you can see sockeye and chinook primarily right now throughout October, maybe the early parts of November. Um, Jones Park is in the city of Renton, um, accessible with these really close vantage spots where you can see them like just a few feet away coming up the river. The Renton Library was built right over the Cedar River, so you can go check out a book um, or get it picked up on hold and go peer over the edge and look down at the salmon as well. At Cedar River Park, this what you're looking at here is the weir that uh, the, fish, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has set up. This is where we capture some of our brood stock for the sockeye hatchery. Um, and so you can see them cleaning off the weir in this case. You can also see on this photo, there's some salmon that were there just yesterday. Um, and Riverview Park has this nice new 
bridge that you can walk on and look down at the salmon. Enjoy that riparian area filled with lots of native species of plants. Belmondo Reach is a new one for me. Um, you can see this landslide that uh, occurred probably last February, perhaps. Um, but there you can see the action of those glaciers from thousands of years up close and personal and how clean that water is. And finally, at the easternmost reach, you can get all the way to Landsberg Park, which is open to the public in just the park area this year. We don't have tours to go into the Landsberg complex itself to see how the fish, the sorting is happening, but you can go to our viewing platform at the park itself and watch a salmon uh, come up the river. I've never gotten to see them in 20 years. I've never seen one actually get up through this uh, rock drop area. But once they get up there, it must be a prime place to spawn because you'll see lots of cleared areas in the gravel that are all cleaned off. And those are the reds where uh, the next generation of salmon are getting ready. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you so much, Katie. That was wonderful. I'm so excited to get back out to the Cedar River again. It really is so beautiful and there's so many fabulous places to watch salmon from. We have some questions. Our first one was, could you define a river mile? Oh, sure. Um, I believe it's simply the amount, you know how rivers go like this? <laughs> so it might be um, just 50 feet, um, for us, but if you were actually traversing the river, it would be uh, maybe twice that. And does the counting for the river mile start at the mouth of the Cedar River and go up? Oh, your lights went out again. <laughs> moving enough. It looks like you're preparing for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to move to get it. But I can't. All right, Danny's coming to help you. <laughs> Our uh, IT guru. <laughs> all in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dark mouth. Um, yes, that is measuring from the mouth of the Cedar River um, at where it meets Lake Washington. Thank you. Um, and then there were two similar questions about the Landsberg. Um, so I'm just going to read them both. Uh, how do the fry and smolt get back over the dam and how are they kept out of the drinking water intake? And the other one was, how, does ju how do juvenile salmon make it back down from Landsberg? Oh, very good questions. Yeah, they, the engineers who came up with this fish passage facility, they had to take that into consideration because the screens that had been there originally were revolving screens where those juveniles would just, you know, meet their fate right after emerging from the gravel and coming downstream. So um, they took out the old screens, they put in new screens called um, V, they're in the shape of a V, they're kind of um, cupped like that. And so while we can screen the water, it sends the fish and debris, juvenile um, fry, it sends them back into a pipe and then that routes them back into the Cedar River. Um, and then for the majority of fish, they can just spill right over the dam. If you remember the photo of the Landsberg Diversion Dam, um, mm -hmm. they re-engineered the gates on that dam so that they're able to just slide right down over that main water flow and continue on their way down the cedar. Thank you. Uh, another question, do male sockeye ever help build a red? Oh, I love that question. Um, not that I'm aware of. I know that they'll guard their females. Um, and if you know something contrary to that, Charlotte, I hope you'll weigh in. We but, can ask Erin next Tuesday. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Our fishery biologist. Tail, but it's, she's busy cleaning off her, the gravel with her tail and getting it all ready um, for, for the depositing of the eggs and the melt. But yes, we should ask Erin next week. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Uh, is the Cedar River watershed unique in the larger Salish Sea watershed or do other local rivers provide similar environments for salmon? Oh, that's a great question. I have 
been so focused on the Cedar River my entire career. Um, I, I think there are other river systems that are quite similar actually in, um, in having good salmon habitat. And I think the things that make this, the Cedar River unique um, compared to others is just what an urban environment that these salmon make their way through um, and that they're still coming back. Um, and the fact that there's a drinking water supply at the top of the watershed that contributes to the, the good habitat for the salmon. I think those are the two things that make the cedar um, a little different than the other uh, watershed surrounding here. And I'm imagining all that wonderful water at the, um, that's in the municipal part of the watershed. It helps keep um, the lower cedar water quality pretty good even in the Lower Cedar and Lake Washington, even though it is a very urban area. Yes, yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, someone is asking, did I hear you correctly that only a few hundred Chinook get past the diversion dam are, and they are moved past the dam by humans picking them up, question mark? Maybe you could elaborate on how that works. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was, Correct, um, that getting a couple hundred Chinook um, above the dam, that would be a, a good number of Chinook. Um, and originally it was designed uh, to have uh, a little bit more of an automated system for the fish passage facility with a long tube that you could just send the salmon through and they would just make their way down this slide. They would just make their way past the dam. Um, but the numbers uh, just didn't seem to justify, it seemed to be easier on the salmon to actually hand carry them over and that it would be faster and more efficient just to get them over that way. Our, our primary goal is to alleviate any stress on those Chinook salmon um, when they show up at Landsberg. So that's why uh, one of the reasons why they're hand carried upstream of the dam. You're very well cared for. <laughs> uh, so, oh, we have a great comment here from one of our former volunteers, Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine, uh, who said she has seen one male sweep the red. So if you spend enough time out uh, observing fish, you could probably see everything because what's really wonderful um, about being out here and spending time with these amazing animals is Sometimes animals, they don't follow what's in the guidebook and they do interesting behavior that um, some of us are lucky enough to witness. So that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that, Lorraine. Uh, somebody is asking, do you expect Landsberg Diversion Dam to open to the public once COVID leaves us alone? Oh, yes. Yes, every year we've had the Cedar River Salmon Journey for the last 22 years. We have been lucky to get to open the gates and take guided tours um, led by trained volunteers into that complex so that you can get a closer look at the source of where your water is coming from. You can see where the sorting is happening for the salmon, um, some of the hatchery operations and the broodstock collection, those pens are available for viewing. So yes, when, when we're done with this COVID, I. I greatly anticipate getting to come back to Landsberg and offer those tours in the future. And so that would be in October 2021, or do you also get to go there if you sign up for a tour through the Watershed Education Center? Uh, none of our tours go okay. typically to the, um, go to Landsberg and all of our tours have uh, stopped due to COVID-19. So, um, Let's be optimistic and hope that 2021 in October, that we're just back to normal. Okay. Thank you. Um, cross fingers. Yeah, there was uh, also a question about uh, that Landsberg slide where you had um, the picture of the Chinook passing and it said uh, the graph had sorted and then passed or no, it sorted. Oh, okay. um, difference between recorded versus sorted. Could you explain what that means? Yeah, that accounts for um, 
maybe a single fish or two that were recorded in our camera that uh, was after we were done in so done with sorting mode that those Chinook must have come through later in the season after we were done sorting that's when we just leave the the gates open the fish ladder is open um, at the fish passage area so those Chinook were recorded coming through uh, with the camera. Uh, there's a question here, um, which maybe we should save um, for Jason Milvahill Kuntz, but it's asking if you can ex explain what's been done so far at Cavanaugh Pond. Um, and Jason, who is the salmon recovery manager for the Lake Washington Cedar Sammamish watershed, is going to be joining us on October 20th to talk. Um, I think he'll address what's happening at Kavanaugh as well as talking about the results of the River Bend, sorry, the uh, Rainbow Bend project. Both of these sites were really impacted by the floods and uh, Rainbow Bend like did great. It did everything it's supposed to do during a big flood. And those of us who are familiar with Kavanaugh know that it changed a lot after that. So um, Katie, do you wanna say anything about that or should we save that question for Jason? Um, yeah, as far as I know, the property has been purchased and it looks like all the mobile homes have been removed and I see bulldozers and fencing. So that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> I'm excited. Right. So come back on October 20th and we can hear from Jason because I think he's going to be sharing um, some information about that. Uh, there's a question here about the Issaquah fish hatchery. Do you know what's happening there? It's, uh, it's closed to the public, we think but can you go there to see salmon and our hatchery activity still underway? I'm not sure if you're familiar with the hatchery. At I, I'm not, but everything tells me that salmon don't just stop coming back. So they, um, I think the hatchery is probably closed due to COVID and because so many people show up to see the salmon and it's probably a public health safety measure just to keep people from being in close proximity with each other or with their volunteers or with the salmon. But um, I can tell you if you go downstream of the hatchery, I've heard of this place called Confluence Park in Issaquah. And I think that would be a place that you could see some uh, salmon coming back um, as well as if you go to Salmon Season website, it gives sites for all over King County that you can see salmon besides the Cedar River. Yes. Um, here is a uh, question. Is there any way to find out up to the day information on where salmon are on a particular day? Um, and uh, we are, well, so we are hoping to be able to go out every week and are hoping to post to social media where we are seeing salmon. We were fortunate to be out um, over the weekend as well as on Monday, and we know that we have seen salmon at uh, four out of the six Cedar River Salmon Journey Program sites, um, and that we see dead ones at some of the lower river sites. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but we'll, we are hoping to share that information. Uh, somebody also asked if this webinar is recorded. It is, and we will be sending out a link to everybody who registered for this webinar. Um, and so we'll also follow up probably with a reminder email about coming next Tuesday, as well as on the 20th, uh, especially if you've got lots of good salmon biology questions, our fisheries biologists from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, who is joining us next Tuesday, will hopefully be able to answer those questions. Somebody responded and said the Issaquah Fish Hatchery is allowing small tours. You have to sign up online. It is closed to the public and tickets are reserved online in parties of five. So I guess visit the Issaquah Hatchery website um, for more information about that. And then somebody, Larry, has said that the stream near Issaquah Hatchery was full of fish. And so, the, as Katie said, the fish are coming back and, and we had a good return of Chinook through the locks, so maybe we'll have a better chance of seeing Chinook as well. Uh, Katie, one last thing, you uh, talked about Chinook at Landsberg. Do you ever see Coho up there? Do you know how Coho are doing above? Um, Coho, from what I've heard, Coho are um, 
they're kind of the understudied species because they're coming back in November when river flows are a lot higher. It's more dangerous to survey for reds in the river. So they're, they're just not as researched, um, but they do see them on camera coming through. Um, as far as specifics on their numbers, I unfortunately don't have any information. I think Aaron will next. Oh, good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't promise, but hopefully he'll give us some more information about all three of the species that uh, we typically see in the Cedar River. So Katie, on a parting note, because I think we are close to 7.30 and we want to be, uh, we want to honor everybody's time. We have two questions for you. Um, what is your favorite salmon? And do you have a favorite site to watch sam from which to watch salmon? Oh, wow. Oh, my favorite salmon to eat is sockeye. I had to go there. Um, <laughs> uh, but as far as, um, I like wild salmon. <laughs> I'm a big fan of wild salmon and a site that I didn't even know about that I just saw I got to go to yesterday is Belmondo Reach. So I am going to put in a plug for that site. There isn't a ton of parking, but the restoration area on the walk down is spectacular to see all those different native species. You could bring your native plant book and just totally geek out and looking them all up, that'd be fun. Um, and then there's this amazing glacial erratic that's sitting in the middle of the river. Um, and then that landslide is just awe-inspiring. I thought yesterday seeing that was really amazing. Yeah, and the water is such a beautiful color there. So those red sockeye really stand out. Um, so for everybody yeah, who's still online, we do, if you go to the Seattle Aquarium website or just Google Salmon Journey, we do have a map which has uh, information on all the different six locations that we recommend to watch salmon from. Um, five of these locations are places where we usually have, sorry, seven. Is it six or seven? Oh, it's six. Anyway, five of these sites we're usually at during um, during the month of October, so we're very familiar with them. And if you want your special pair of salmon glasses to help cut down on the glare of the river, be sure to order these. We are sending them out to anybody who's requesting them uh, while or while supplies last. Um, and we love to know if you make it out there. So again, Katie, thank you so much. Uh, this was a, a wonderful talk, uh, very informative, and we're thrilled that you were able to join us this evening. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Katie's been part of the Cedar River Salmon Journey Program from almost the beginning. Um, didn't you start as a volunteer? Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, so yes, join. Maybe Katie, if you could um, stop sharing your screen, I'll just put up the slide with the reminder of who are um, the marking your calendars so that uh, you can all make sure to join us. Can, can you see that? I don't know if I'm sharing my slide. Okay. There we go. So yeah, on Tuesday, October 13th, uh, Aaron will be coming to talk to us about uh, Cedar River salmon and their population trends. And on October 20th, Jason Mulvihill Kuntz will be coming to talk about F local efforts to restore salmon. So we'll be, he'll be talking about some of those big restoration projects that Katie referred to, as well as uh, other local efforts for creating healthy habitat for salmon, including what we can all do. So again, thank you all for joining us this evening. We really appreciate you taking time uh, to come and join us and to learn more about the Cedar River. We hope to see you next Tuesday and again on the 20th. And thank you so much to all the volunteers, partners, and sponsors that make this program possible. So until next Tuesday, goodbye. <laughs>